Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris O'Brien. I'm a senior engineering manager uh, with Tinder, and this is Chris Thomas, also another engineering manager with Tinder. Um, and we want to talk you through um, the decision to move to Kubernetes and also what the process was like. Uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, what Tinder is, but in case you don't, um, or you need a recap. Uh, Tinder is the world's uh, most popular app for meeting new people. Um, and our size and scale uh, means greater choice and access to a diverse set of matches. Uh, and, Chris and, I are gonna, Chris and I are gonna talk through how we are able to handle that scale um, through the amazing work of Tinder Engineering and the Cloud Infrastructure team. So over two years ago, as was previously mentioned, uh, Tinder decided to move its platform to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes uh, afforded us an opportunity to uh, drive Tinder Engineering towards containerization and low-touch operation um, through immut immutable deployment. Uh, and as a result, application build, deployment, and infrastructure would be defined in code. Uh, we were looking to address the ch challenges of scale and stability. Uh, when scaling would become critical, we offer, often would suffer through several minutes of waiting for new Amazon instances to populate in an auto-scaling group and come online. Uh, and the idea of container scheduling and becoming uh, uh, serving traffic within seconds as opposed to minutes was very appealing to us. So starting January 2018, uh, we worked our th way through various stages of the migration effort. Uh, we started by containerizing all of our services uh, and deploying them to a series of Kubernetes hosted staging environments. And beginning in October of last year, we began methodically cutting uh, all of the legacy services over to their counterpart on Kubernetes. Uh, and by March of the following year, we finalized our migration, and the Tinder platform now runs exclusively on Kubernetes. So we'll talk through uh, our legacy architecture, uh, building images, our CI CD platform, uh, the original architecture, uh, the migration some learnings along the way, uh, load balancing and how we're leveraging Envoy, uh, the current architecture, as well as our monitoring stack, uh, and the future architecture. So the legacy architecture, as I previously mentioned, were all uh, hosts on Amazon in auto-scaling groups. Uh, they were fronted by a load balancer per service uh, and scaling based on CPU usage. Uh, we had minimal tooling to automate the provisioning of these auto-scaling groups, uh, and, but we did use Puppet for bootstrapping node configuration uh, and also uh, setting up Prometheus nodes to monitor each of the service, services. Uh, code deployments were pushed, uh, basically pushed a new version to an NFS mount and in a fairly archaic way uh, you know, would, would trigger a service restart. So as I mentioned, you know, the first step of the migration was actually building these container images. Uh, luckily, Tinder had, had already started a push towards microservices long before we started the migration. Uh, but as a result, we had more than 30 source repositories uh, with a variety of different languages. Uh, Node.js, Java, Scala, Go, uh, among some of the biggest. Um, so what we needed uh, to facilitate these, the diverse set of repositories was a fully customizable build context with a standardized format. Uh, and also in a format that our uh, engineering teams could easily uh, understand and write. And we also wanted to standardize the build process for deployment and production. One of the ways that we were able to do this was create a builder container. Um, so images are actually built within a container, uh, and the builder container, while it has a standardized set of, of tools, uh, it, it's able to tailor itself to the unique needs of the image, the unique requirements or dependencies of the, uh, uh, of the image that it needs to build. And this is our CI CD uh, uh, platform. Uh, obviously, a pretty busy slide, so I'll kind of talk you through um, you know, what are, was kind of the most relevant, uh, at least to the Kubernetes migration. Um, but as you can see, the, you know, the, uh, without our CI CD pipeline, uh, the move to Kubernetes would not be possible. And, and the complexity on this uh, diagram represents um, the, uh, the, the years of exceptional engineering to be able to get to this point. Um, so at the very top, you have our CI CD repository. Um, and this is basically defining what services you can build and where they should be deployed. And then, of course, you have your code repositories, for example, your, your, Go, your Go repository or your Java repository, and in them is the make file. 
And basically, the uh, CI-CD platform will schedule uh, a builder container to build a specific image for whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever application is specified as part of the manifest. Um, it, it is, so it's not just Jenkins. You know, we use Jenkins for UI and for scheduling, but under the hood is a robust CI-CD framework that we, we're using to do all sorts of things. Obviously, deploy to Kubernetes, provision infrastructure using Terraform, uh, and in the future, also, you, you know, also build in to uh, start it to leverage it to uh, execute some of our puppet manifests. Uh, at the end of the day, what ends up happening is that the uh, image that's built as part of the builder container is push, pushed to Amazon's container registry, um, and then obviously the deployment object is updated within Kubernetes through the uh, CI-CD platform to point to that new image. So the original architecture, we used uh, Kube AWS for provisioning, uh, as we are an Amazon shop, and that was you know, kind of readily available to us at that time. Uh, initially, we had one node pool, one big node pool, uh, but we quickly separated into different, different sizes and types, uh, and what we found is that running fewer heavily threaded, uh, jo uh, heavily threaded pods, for example, Java, together yielded better performance than having them co-locate with single-threaded single workloads. Uh, eventually, we settled on uh, a combination of uh, C5 4XL and C5 2XL uh, uh, instances for our various uh, various components, so control plane masters, etcd, uh, our single threaded worker pool, and our multi threaded worker pool, uh, pool in Java and Go, uh, and we also settled on a uh, more memory, uh, uh, so an M5 instance type for our memory intense applications, for example, our monitoring stack. So the actual migration. Um, basically, what we did is we, we, we changed uh, existing service-to-service -service calls within the Tinder platform to, to new load balancers. Um, we basically peered uh, the uh, existing VPC uh, to the new uh, Kubernetes VPC in Amazon. And this allowed us to granularly uh, migrate modules with no regard to order or dependency chain. Uh, endpoints use weighted DNS records with CNAM to the new ELB, uh, and this afforded us an opportunity to, uh, to control the volume of traffic and also facilitate us the opportunity to roll back if we had any issues. For the migration, uh, obviously since we were using DNS, uh, TTL was lowered and weight was adjusted to, to, to uh, be able to very granularly adjust and on the fly adjust this, the, the traffic volumes for these, these modules. Um, what we found is that our Java repositories honored the low TTL, but, no, but our Node.js repository did not. And so what we had to do is uh, spend some engineering effort to rework our connection pool um, so that it would refresh those connections every 60 seconds and get the latest, uh, uh, latest uh, resolution for that particular host name. So learnings, uh, you have to bear with me, we're gonna go a, a little bit into the, uh, to the technical weeds for a couple of slides. Um, we had a series of uh, a fairly painful outages in January and also earlier, you know, early in, uh, earlier this year. Um, and it was kind of the result of, of kind of two, two key things that unfolded. Um, so the first thing was uh, our ARP table entries. Um, so basically, January, January 8th, 2019, we were down for several hours, uh, and it was, basically, it was basically the result uh, of an unrelated scale-up earlier in the day that left the cluster at a larger size than ever before. As a result, um, the, you know, the, the ARP table ran out of available entries, right? So when, uh, once, once pod and node counts reach a certain point, and so this resulted in drop packets and, and entire uh, slash 24 flannel uh, address spaces missing from the art tables. We were, at that time, we were using flannel for our, uh, our networking. So as a result, you know, we had to raise some of the values via C C CTL on the nodes themselves, right, to expand the size of that uh, ARP table or ARP cache, and we restarted flannel all of the nodes, on all the nodes. And then finally, the other, uh, one of the other challenges we worked out were DNS timeouts. So our engineering teams were constantly complaining about error rates, um, at least for some of our bigger modules on uh, just general error rates. They couldn't, they just would get these strange, uh, could not connect to other service, right? Could not resolve the DNS for a particular service uh, endpoint. Um, and this is, you know, what we've, we actually stumbled upon a number of, our, a number of people uh, within the industry that had faced uh, a similar, uh, similar situation. And basically there's a, basically it has to do with a race condition that happens within the uh, connection track uh, module within the Linux kernel that, um, you know, is the direct result of, of source net and, and destination net. 
and the issue were, the issues were amplified by, by many, by the amount of lookups that we were doing on our, uh, for DNS within our cluster. So we actually, I mean, at the first case, we just thought it was a matter of scale. Um, you know, we peaked at something like 250,000 DNS requests a second, uh, and 120, which resulted in 120 cores of usage over 1,000 core DNS pods. Um, but it became clear to us that no, no matter how many uh, pods, uh, DNS pods, we threw at this particular problem, it just wasn't getting any better. Um, and that's kind of when we stumbled upon the article uh, and some of the various articles that, uh, of other, uh, other industry people that were, that were suffering through the same, uh, same issues that we were. Uh, and so what we, did is, um, uh, what we did is we kind of took the, the, the race condition or the issue with, with SNAT and DNAT out of the equation. You know, we, we redeployed uh, core DNS as a daemon set uh, and injected the, uh, the node IP into resolve.conf uh, so that, that it, it, a, a pods or a container's first lookup would be on the uh, the node itself. It would not be on, uh, it, it would not fall back to some service that resulted in uh, SNAT and DNAT translation. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, uh, to Chris. Thank you. Um, so I'll go over some of our load balancing and um, performance issues we came across when we first migrated. Um, initially, we had unbalanced load across the pods due to ELB connections sticking to the first set of ready pods that would come out of each deployment. Um, and this was mostly due to keep alive and the way ELBs keep connections open to nodes. Um, so we, we attempted multiple mitigations. Um, one was very brute, kind of crude, but max surge to 100%, so you'd hope that you know, most of your pods would come up at the same time. Uh, we inflated resource requests, which also helped a bit. Um, but in, inevitably, you'd have some pods way hotter than others. Um, so we had some internal POCs for Envoy, which proved to be successful, and this gave us a chance to leverage it in a limited fashion. Um, so we deployed side, Envoy sidecars alongside each heavy service, um, and so it resulted in a small fleet of Envoy proxies running in front of uh, the services that were most affected, um, and those were deployed with one single deployment in each AZ, just to ensure that we had uh, even distribution of pods um, without skewing one AZ too, too far in one direction. Um, and each of those small proxy layers was fronted by a, a TCP ELB. Um, so one of the ways we got this to work very smoothly was to put a pre-stop hook on the sidecar, which calls the Envoy health check fail admin endpoint. Uh, as well as a small, I think, 10, 10 second sleep to allow in-flight connections to complete and drain. Um, and that proved very uh, st stable. Um, so Envoy itself, um, I'm sure many of you have seen it or used it. So this is just an example of how you could see the CPU convergence on one of our services from the time that which we, we cut it over from running on the old uh, you know, service endpoint in Kubernetes to one of these Envoy uh, fronted ones. So you can see some of them are as little as 25% of their requested CPU all the way up to, you know, nearly 200%. And as we cut it over slowly, they converged into a very, um, very close point. Um, this is kind of a, an example of the service flow. So you'd see the main proxy layer coming in and hitting an ELB and then having specific service pods get hotter than others. But what the net result would be after this is you may have some Envoy pods be hotter than others, but they're much more suited to be able to handle um, more traffic than not, and then equally distribute it using uh, the least request algorithm to the service pods. Um, so our current cluster architecture, right now we're around 2,000 nodes, 18,000 cores or so. Uh, we have six control plane masters, 25 to 30,000 pods on any given moment, depending on how the auto scaling is working, uh, 115 to 130,000 containers as we run many sidecars on each pod, many meaning anywhere from two to six. Um, our Prometheus stack ingests around 750,000 samples per second. We have a roughly five terabytes per day of uh, log ingestion into our Elk stack. Uh, and we're currently in the middle of an Envoy uh, service mesh migration. I'd say we probably have 10% of our services on service mesh. 
Um, here's a diagram of our old monitoring stack, and the reason I bring this up is um, it quickly hit limitations. So you can see we have our services separated into distinct namespaces for each one, and they each ran their own Prometheus pod, or actually two, um, which would then write to a long-term Prometheus um, storage, uh, which is what the Grafana server actually hits. So each of these you know, orange and green boxes, basically you'd have to vertically scale them, and it didn't work very well after a certain point. Um, so the new monitoring stack we've got is actually uh, based with, on Thanos, and um, the pods actually run a sidecar that uh, drop all of the excess metrics that we don't need. So we have our developers uh, specifically put in rules for rollups and things uh, in their module manifests that will tell the sidecar exactly what to collect and everything else is dropped. Um, and then we have two Prometheus pods per namespace just for redundancy. And then those have a Thanos sidecar running on them. Um, and those write to S3 as well as um, the, the Thanos stores are then capable of reading the, the long-term data out of S3. So then the, the query layer is what Grafana talks to, and um, it effectively scales much more horizontally than before. Uh, and we also run a Prometheus vertical autoscaler for the times where an individual um, service needs to be scaled up a little bit to handle maybe some new metrics that the developers put in. Uh, this is an a diagram of our future architecture. So instead of having one cluster spanning multiple AZs, we're actually going to create a cluster in four different AZs. Um, this is in the works right now. It is not fully out there yet, um, but this is basically what it'll look like. And uh, the only real change that we need to make, of course, is from the CI CD layer to be able to deploy to four different clusters for one deployment instead of one. Uh, as well as breaking out some of the Prometheus aggregation into EC2 instances that will allow us to swap these clusters in and out, upgrade them, and so forth without having to worry about losing metrics or having the metrics tied into the cluster directly. Um, and of course, all of that then you know, writes and reads from various Amazon services. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Yeah.